Good morning, good morning, and welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ here in Bellingham, Washington. It's good to be together. So glad to see you, whether you are worshiping here in the sanctuary or online in the bigger balcony. Welcome. Um, as part of our welcome, every once in a while, we have the opportunity to invite from the congregation somebody to read part of the liturgy. So if you have never done this before at First Congregational, and it's something you have been wanting to do or hoping to do, I have the prayer of confession all typed out with every bit of information you need, just as a moment for anybody who has been wanting to dip your toe in reading from the pulpit. Anybody like that this morning? Yes, wonderful, thank you. Everything that you need is on there. Perfect, thank you, Heidi. So this will be right after the hymn. Okay. Okay? All right. Thank you, Heidi. So grateful. Ah. So yes, the extravagant welcome. And that means no matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. If you are seeking, hoping, fearful, if you are wondering, anxious, needing a space to simply be, if you are joyful, if you are questioning, no matter what, no matter who you are, you are welcome here. And you are beloved of God. The story around which we gather this morning is not just any story, but is one of the parables of Jesus. If you're not that familiar with parables, let me name that it is my joy that our Lenten theme is about humility. Because every time I read or hear one of the parables of Jesus, I am a little bit humbled. So... Jesus tells a story about a person of some wealth who bought some land and cleared away what was on the land and built a fence around it and planted grapes and built a watchtower and a cistern and everything you need for a vineyard. And then that wealthy man hired some tenants and left them to work the vineyard. When the season arrived to harvest the grapes, the wealthy man sent a servant to the tenants to receive the portion of the proceeds that they had agreed upon. The tenants chased the messenger away, shouting at them and bludgeoning them. So the wealthy man did it again. And the tenants did it again. 
And so it came to pass over and over, some of the messengers they sent away with wounds, some of them they killed outright, until the wealthy man had only one servant left, his own son. So he sent his son to get the proceeds from the vineyard. And the tenants said, if we kill the son, then we can inherit this vineyard. And they did. (laughs) That's the story Jesus told. Children this morning who'd like to join me up front, if you are worshiping in the bigger balcony, I invite you to gaze upon this wonderful tower I have. Oh good, Isa, I'm so glad you're here this morning because I have, I have to ask somebody for advice. Um, today in the bulletin it says, uh, there's a question in, in the bulletin that says, how do you listen well for the voice of wisdom? So I'm gonna be listening for your voice of wisdom, okay? And you can listen to the rest of the congregation to see if they're gonna be giving you wisdom as well, okay? So um, I'm listening for your voice of wisdom today. So I've got this giant Jenga, you know, these blocks that are all together. And so I would like your wisdom to tell me if I, Is this a block that I can take out without the tower falling? You can ask the congregation. What do you think? Do you want to ask them? Or do you want to just tell me? Yes, Yes, this is a block that I can take out without the tower falling. Great. Thank you for that wisdom. I appreciate it. All right. Let's see. Is this one a block you can think I can take out without it falling? You think so? Do you want to ask the congregation or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, congregation, is this a block you think I can take out? Okay, great. Thanks for the wisdom. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom with Issa as well. Okay. Is this one a block you think I can take out? Okay, I'm going to try it a little more gently. She told me to try gently. Oh, thank you. Gosh, Issa, you're good at this. All right. What do you think? I'm making this too easy or too hard? Too easy, they say. Okay. All right, I'm going to pull this one, all right? (sighs) <sighs> okay. Is this one one I can do? We can't see it yet. Can't, you, can't see it? It's, it's this one. All right, let me try to do one in the front. How about, how about this one? Can I do this one without the tower tumbling? What do you think, Isa? You think it'll tip over? Because there's a space there. You, you do? Also these two. Okay, so you think this one, that, that this one, if I take this block out, it's going to tip over. Um, I don't... Get a little more wobbly. Okay, you're telling me this, Issa, but I don't know that, I don't know that I'm going to listen to that. Oh. <laughs> what about the congregation? Do you think if I take this one out, the tower will tumble? I'm seeing yeses. I'm seeing a no. I'm seeing a couple no's. All right. Well, I'm not going to listen to Issa. I'm just going to listen to my own self. Pull the block. Pull the block. I think I can pull this block. Gosh darn it! I should have listened to Isa. You knew it. 
sometimes I feel like we do this with God. I feel like sometimes I listen, and sometimes I do my own thing and it works, and sometimes I do my own thing and it works, <laughs> and sometimes I can go a lot of times and it works. But you know what? If I keep listening to myself and not listening to the wise ones around me, that's what's probably going to happen. If I'd have kept going, it would have, wouldn't it? Yeah. Sometimes we need to listen to ourselves. And sometimes we have enough information. But sometimes we need to stop and listen to God. Otherwise, things might start to fall apart. And when things fall apart, you know, sometimes we can try to fix it. We could fix this Jenga tower, right? I mean, we could. That's easy. But sometimes when we make a mistake and we don't listen well enough, we make a mistake and we can't fix it. Like when we hurt a friend, when we've, um, you know, not done something that we really know we should. And uh, those times come and we have to start all over and maybe, maybe we can't rebuild the blocks, but we can, what can we do? Well, sometimes in my school, we do an example, like the teacher draws like a uh, human. Okay. And then we like would say something like what, like, pretend like that person was a new person at school oh. and then people say like not that nice thing and the teacher crumples it oh. and then crumples it and yeah. then people then say happy things to that hateful person uh. and then they keep on doing it but you can't always uncrumple it yeah. so then I would just maybe get a new piece of paper Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. Okay, so the wisdom that Issa just shared with us is that sometimes at school, the teacher will draw a person on a piece of paper. And then each mean thing that somebody says to it, the paper gets crumpled and more crumpled and crumpled until it's all crumpled <laughs> up. And the teacher says, what can you do? And so you start to say nice things and it starts to get uncrumpled. But sometimes there are wrinkles that don't come out it's always wrinkled that those hurtful things are still there. And sometimes you just can't uncrumple it, and so you need to start with a new paper. And that's exactly right, thank you. Um, sometimes we can't make things right, but we can apologize and try to start over. And I feel like sometimes that's what the voice of God invites us to do. Stop, pay attention to what we've done, and maybe start over. Thank you for that wisdom, Isa. I so appreciate it. Thank you for sharing it with me and everybody. I know that's sometimes scary, um, but I, I love that. And I think my prayer today is, God, thank you for the wisdom that we can listen to from others around us, from teachers, from within us, and from you. Amen. Now you can either go to church school with Josh or go back to your seat.
Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the prayer of confession. God, sometimes we miss you the first time you call us. You call us to love, to action, to rest, and we need another call. God, sometimes we miss you the second time you call us. You call us to justice, to healing, to connection, and we need another call. God, sometimes we miss you every time you call us. You call us in scripture, you call us in our neighbors, you call us in creation. When we fail to hear, renew us with your grace and forgiveness. Make us new in our capacity to listen. Sometimes when we have broken things, it is hard to ask forgiveness. And yet, this is what God calls us to. And so friends, hear this. God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness is with us. Because our God is bigger than all of it. You are loved. We are loved. This is the sound of our prayers, and the Spirit intercedes for us. With sighs, with sighs too deep for words. With sighs, with sighs too deep. We enter into a time of communal prayer. And so if you have something that you would like to share with this body, I'll invite you to do so in just a moment. First, I begin with shares for prayers for Shannon McGinnis, who with her husband, Jeff, is preparing for their first child. Prayers also for traveling mercies for Kathleen and Scott McGinnis as they travel to Spain to be with them. We offer prayers for the life of D.C. Morse, who we celebrated yesterday, and continued prayers for his wife Jan and all of their family in this time of grief. We celebrate and pray for the continuing work of the Poor People's Campaign, who does such good work across the nation for so many different causes. We pray this morning for people living with mental illness and we pray this morning for Rudy Cortez as he prepares for heart surgery this coming Thursday. 
If you have something to pray, I ask that if you name somebody, be sure to have their permission if you offer their name, but otherwise simply say a friend who is going through. But now I invite your prayers. Rudy. A prayer for one of our congregants having knee surgery tomorrow. For the people of Gaza. Chris. Thank you, Chris. A prayer for a friend who has lived with homelessness most of her life, and then on Monday, after finally getting into an apartment, having had a stroke, and is now in the ICU with a lot of health concerns. So prayers for her and for the doctors caring for her and for all folk experiencing homelessness. For a friend who has been back and forth to the hospital with sepsis after a knee replacement. Spencer. For a family friend who has been diagnosed with late stage cancer, stage four. On this first anniversary of your brother-in-law's death, prayers for your sister and all who miss him so much. Lori. For the people of Ukraine. All of these prayers we gather into our spirits all of the prayers shared on Facebook and on Zoom, we gather as well. All of those prayers silent in our hearts. Let's take a moment of silence together. God, you bring us into community and we share parts of ourselves that sometimes the rest of the world never sees. Our tears and our laughter, our love, all of this. Thank you for the gift of community and sharing this. For all of the pain in the world, oh God, bring ease. For all of the joys, help us celebrate together. And amidst all of it, we live following the Christ who taught us to pray together. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the sound of our prayers, and the Spirit intercedes for us. With sighs, with sighs too deep for words. With sighs, with sighs too deep for words. Good morning, I'm Mary Swenson, standing in for Stacy, who is sick today. Um, I admit to some ease, unease in reading this provision because it speaks of an owner who has sharecroppers and of an owner who also has slaves. The sharecroppers are violent and the slaves are the victims of that violence, but it, ha it raises a lot of questions. Then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he teased it to the tenant, excuse me, then he leased it to the tenants and went away. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and, <clears throat> and beat him and sent him away empty-handed, and again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. Finally he said, <clears throat> sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left him and went away. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, the actions of my life be acceptable to you, my strength and my liberator. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you know that I love a good parable. I think I love this parable, though. I, like Mary, have some um, at least dis-ease, if not um, troubled spirit in approaching it. I think it's actually quite appropriate that I get to stand here amid some rubble, though it's, you know, child-sized rubble. Here amid some rubble as I'm invited to reflect a little bit and inviting y'all to reflect a little bit, um, not on what this parable means, because I think if we pin down what a parable means, we have lost track of it. But to reflect instead on what this parable means for us today, here in whatever rubble we stand in. 
To do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about theology, and I'm going to talk a little bit about politics, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, bread. So I do think the rubble is appropriate here for our ground to be a little uneven and shaky, to not be quite sure where it is that we step. Certainly the hearers of this parable when it was first spoken, certainly the first readers and hearers of the Gospel of Mark had at best uncertain footing. In the midst of death, and maybe resurrection, in the midst of Roman occupation, in the midst of the destruction of the temple. To tell stories about disloyalty and violence, well, that would have been at least familiar to many of the hearers. And we can hear this story in the midst of wars and rumors of wars, in the midst of economic upheaval, in the midst of all the smaller ruins of our own lives, loneliness and hard diagnoses, losing friends, uncertainty in so many ways. One of the things that intrigues me in this story is the foolishness of the landlord. This one who over and over again sends a messenger to the tenants to ask for what's due them. The messengers are berated, the messengers experience violence, and still the messages come. One of the great gifts of my um, theological studies was getting to hang out with some process theologians, folks who um, cultivate this understanding of who God is. Um, I don't know if I'll do it justice, but I'll give it a shot. So in every moment, they say, and I have come to believe, God is calling each one of us. Not just each one of us, but all of humanity and all the creatures and maybe the rocks and sticks beside. In every moment, our lives are called to whatever course of action in that very moment that would create the most justice and beauty creativity and complexity, love and wholeness in all of creation. One of the things I love about this model is that in each moment, God is calling each of us. And some of us take up that call, and some of us set it aside. But then the next moment comes. And there's another call for each of us all the time. Okay, look. Like, the author is problematic, but I still love Harry Potter. And there's a beautiful series of scenes in that first book, which you may recall, if you, like me, love Harry Potter, when Harry is getting letters inviting him to wizard school. He gets one at first, and his parents, his caregivers, I guess, see it and freak out and throw it in the fireplace. And so another comes the next day. And then the next day there's two, and there's more and more and more until the letters fill the house, and they get in the car and they drive to a distant island. They say, we're going on vacation. And they're in a cottage on a miserable lake in the English countryside. And the letters keep coming through every door and window. And they're burning them and tearing them. And then Hagrid arrives. On a flying motorcycle, probably. It's been a while since I've read it. 
this beautiful eight foot tall, strange, um, loving, kind, strong presence who, um, you know, kicks open the door and takes Harry to wizard school. This is just to say that in my experience of listening for the spirit, if you miss it the first time and it's important, she will escalate. Look, sometimes I get to talk with folks about dreams. I love talking with folks about dreams. And it is always my experience with hearing from the divine in dreams myself or in people that I trust, that if you miss it the first time, it'll come back. So if you have a strange dream once and you think, maybe I should reflect on that, but then, you know, you got to get the kids off to school or the dog wants to go out and you kind of forget about it, look, the Holy Spirit is full of grace and full of persistence, so she's going to keep coming at you, friends. If you've been having the same dream over and over, let me save you some time. Take a look. Give a listen. Because the spirit will continue to escalate, and then before you know it, the door will be knocked on or broken down by a friendly giant or some other person coming to be an in-the-flesh invitation for whatever you're missing from the spirit. So, maybe your Lenten practice hasn't really landed for you. Maybe there's some empty spot in your soul that just feels like it's like waiting for the right moment. Maybe there's some discomfort there when you pray. And you're like, what is that about? Let me invite you, listen again for another letter in your mailbox, for a thundering half-giant fist on your door for a kind word from a neighbor that you are least expecting. God is foolish like the landlord and will keep throwing good news after bad until you say yes or until the next moment arrives. But parables, thanks be to God, don't have to be just one thing. So let me also say that Mary is not wrong to name some of the troubling things about this story. The hearers of Mark's Gospels were, spoiler alert, mostly not wealthy landowners who were putting up vineyards. It was more folks who knew what it was like to be a tenant laborer. If you're going to put up a vineyard and make wine, mostly a luxury good in that context, you would have to, I guess not bulldoze, but plow under all kinds of subsistence crops. It was a time when a lot of the kind of local farms that people were living on for generations and farming and feeding their families with were getting bought up by bigger and bigger conglomerates, merchants. And so that context would have been ringing in the ears and hearts and hungry bodies of the hearers of Mark's gospel when it was first proclaimed. There may have even been a kind of ruthless joy in those violent ends taken up by those farmers. Yesterday, I um, got to go down to Olympia with about, um, I don't know, eight or ten of us from First Congregational to the uh, Poor People's Campaign Rally. I was talking to a friend of mine as I was on the way there, and she said, oh, is that still a thing? <laughs> because she knew it from history. And it was my joy to describe to her what the Poor People's campaign is like these days. We stood on the steps of the Capitol and heard witness from so many powerful voices. 
preachers and community leaders and a ton of folks with their own lived experience of poverty. They talked about how poverty tied into the evils of gun violence or the evils of environmental devastation. Over and over again, these powerful voices were lifted up there on the steps of the Capitol. It was a joy to hear. It was a challenging joy, but it was a joy. I found myself thinking of the other times those voices were raised on the steps of that capital. And something like 30 other state capitals yesterday had similar rallies with similar voices with their own profound and heartbreaking and true stories. How long will it take us to hear the message, to hear the cries of the poor. I have to say, the thing that stuck with me most profoundly from yesterday um, happened after I got home. I thought it was kind of unrelated. I had had kind of a heavy day. I sat in on um, bedtime um, with my family. And there's a beautiful book that we read And in the end of the book, there's an author's note. <laughs> and whenever there's an author's note in one of these profound and beautiful picture books that are so, um, so thankfully widely available these days, um, there's a part of me that's like, don't read the author's note. <laughs> because it's always true and often troubling. And I found out in the author's note that in 2018, um, the estimated number of children who experienced um, in the US a family member, a parent, I think, being incarcerated was 5 million. We don't have to listen very closely, to know that what's happening now in our culture, in our communities, is not working. On some fundamental levels, it must be overturned and transformed and perhaps resurrected. What does it mean to hear the cry of the poor in your life, in your community, in this congregation? Let us listen again. So then there's this bread on the table here. I love parables in part because um, I can talk about them, but I can't explain them. <laughs> There's stories that I think deliberately, actually. I think Jesus, in his wisdom, the spirit, in her wisdom, the mystical collaboration between those and other troublemakers. I think they're designed to keep our hearts open, to keep our minds curious, to maybe refuse us to let us, maybe refuse to let us settle in too deeply in whatever answers we've held on to for now. So when you're listening, for how the call of the poor might change your life and work and ways. When you're listening for what the Spirit might be calling you to in this moment, for the first time, or again and again and again. Use your mind, friends. 
siblings, beloved of God. Use your hearts, use all the love that is available to you, but listen also to your bodies. In a moment, whether you're here in person or joining us online or watching this later on, in a moment you're going to be invited, I assure you, it's for you, to come and eat some bread and drink some juice. And this bread is its own mystery, is its own proclamation of the things we don't understand and can't claim to hold on to for too long. But what is it like if we just pile up the rubble of our lives and our cultures here under the foot of this table, spacious and graceful and beautiful and scarred? What will it mean to listen also to our bodies? as we stand here in humble and begrudging experience of mystery, not knowing what spirit is saying, not know, knowing what the poor will call us to, but beginning to know and feeling hungry. Amen.
We've come to the time of communion, and that is a time when we are all welcome, as always. If you are here, if you are worshiping with us, this is your table. It is yours because Christ has prepared it for you. It does not matter if you are a member of this congregation or a visitor. Please know that you are welcome. We have, the way that we offer communion is that we invite you to come out of your pew via your left-hand side, come forward, and somebody will offer you a piece of bread that you can dip into the grape juice, and then return to your seat via your right-hand side. So you're just gonna make a circle. And folk in the balcony can either come down or we'll have somebody come up to you as well. If, it is, if it's for you to stay in your seats this morning, then somebody will also come around and serve you in your seat. And um, we also have just small cups. If you prefer not to dip into the communal cup, you can take one of the small ones that da da Pastor Davi will be holding. Yeah, I think that's all we need in instructions. So just know that this is for you, from Christ. Come, let us bring our gifts to God in praise. Come, let us bring our gifts to God in praise, so that we might minister in countless ways, so that we might minister in countless ways. Come, let us bring the warm and fragrant bread. Come, let us bring the warm and fragrant bread. Broken here so all God's people might be fed. Broken here so all God's people might be fed. sweet abundant wine come let us bring the sweet abundant wine in this cup we taste the joy of grace divine in this cup we taste the joy of grace divine on the night before he was tortured and executed. On the night he was arrested, Jesus gathered with additional troublemakers and shared a meal. I'm sure they told stories. I'm sure they sang songs. I'm sure they laughed and cried. And in the midst of the meal, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. When you eat it, remember me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and gave thanks. And he said, this wine is my blood, a new covenant poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin." a cup of new creation. Whenever you drink, remember me. And so all of us, in our hearts and minds and body, confused or not, we are invited to this table, which is the table of love. Will you come?
Christ, for setting this table, I give you thanks. For the bread of life and the cup of blessing, I give you thanks. For the ways that we can come together in body, in spirit, 
in mind and heart. Thank you. Amen. I want to share some news about events in the life of the congregation and in the community. Hope that you'll prayerfully consider response to this uh, as part of your worship experience. If you're visiting us today and you'd like us to be able to uh, say hello or be in touch, there's a visitor card in the back of the pew. You can also leave a comment if you're joining us on Facebook or Zoom. We'd be glad to hear from you and glad to say hello. Um, next Sunday after worship, if you'd like to learn more about being a greeter at one of the doors, an usher during the service, uh, let's see, a liturgist uh, reading the scripture or the prayers, a uh, communion server, um, one of those worship roles, there'll be a little um, information session and, and I hesitate to say training, but I think it's a training um, after worship uh, next Sunday uh, here in the sanctuary. Um, after worship today, we have the second part of our two-part inquirer series. If you're curious to learn more about First Congregational, whether or not you were able to join us last Sunday, we'd love to have you with us in the fireplace room, which is just on the other side of the kitchen, or you can follow me there after worship. Um, unfortunately, we've had um, another of these email scams going around uh, the congregation, um, so uh, no one on church staff will ask you to send them gift cards um, if they do, please let the office know. Really, either way, whether that's a scam or not, please let the office know. Um, and apologies for the inconvenience. Um, we're going to pause the Wednesday night adult forum for now as we reimagine what that program will look like. So no Wednesday forum this week or some of the upcoming weeks. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, our office hours are changing slightly as our office manager's hours are reduced, so the office will be open each weekday from 10 a.m. to 4.30. And finally, um, this Friday, we have Women's Day. We're hosting um, the local PEO chapters and some other organizations are collaborating on that. Um, one to four this Friday. Sounds like they've got some wonderful speakers coming, and I hope you'll consider being part of it. So we now come to a part in our service where you're invited to share, um, share gifts financially. Um, you can give online, you can put some money in the plate. If you're new to the community or don't have money to spare, please know that you gift us in other ways. Please feel no pressure to give, but give as the Spirit leads us, as leads you and us. Thank you.
listen for the divine. Listen again. Listen again. Listen again. The Holy Spirit speaks, invites, cajoles. May you go out this week listening. Go in peace. Go in justice. Amen.